Okay, we're going to get started. I'm, I'm Dan Rundy. I'm the Schreier Chair here at CSIS, and um, I also lead something called the Project on Prosperity and Development. And we're here today to talk about U.S. global leadership in five critical payments. I, I liked five easy payments, but I suspect five critical payments, I think, gets the message across. Um, we're talking about the United States and the general capital increase. The general capital increase, for those of you who are not familiar with some of the ins and outs of the World Bank system and the other multilateral development banks, is a um, unique uh, request for additional an additional increase in the shares of the World Bank and some of the other regional multilateral development banks. This is not your typical hat passing exercise that the Capitol Hill gets year over year. This is about the de facto control over the World Bank and the multilateral development banks. And to the extent that the United States does not participate in the general capital increase, is to the extent that we are making a down payment on American decline. This is a critical uh, decision. It's in front of the Congress that the Obama administration has put before the Congress. And it's a particularly difficult time um, to be uh, asking for money. I think everybody knows this is a particularly difficult moment because of the, the, the era of austerity that we're in. Uh, but it uh, has national security implications. It has implications for our leadership in the world. It has implications for development. Uh, and so I think this is a uh, particularly uh, opportune moment for us to be having this discussion. We're very, very fortunate and we're honored here at CSIS to have two uh, great leaders on this issue. We have Chairman Gary Miller. Uh, re Republican from California who's here. He's going to make some opening remarks about where this stands on Capitol Hill. He's led four hearings in his committee on this topic. And then we're very fortunate to have Under Secretary Lael Brainerd uh, from the Treasury Department for Interna International Affairs. Many of you, of course, know her uh, in her various incarnations in public service. Um, these are two very dedicated and very able public servants, and the country is very fortunate to have leaders like this at this time leading a very difficult lift. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to turn the floor over to Chairman Miller. Chairman Miller. Well, I want to thank you for having me here today to join you for your event. Um, appreciate the opportunity to be here to you with and congratulate CSIS for convening this discussion on the importance of U.S. leadership at the MDBs for national and economic security. Today's moderator, Mr. Dan Rundy, um, honored us yesterday with his testimony. He's a wealth of knowledge, and it was refreshing to hear his point of view on this issue, and uh, it added a lot to the hearing we had. In addition, one of the panelists today was former Ambassador Congressman Mark Green, and Mark was a classmate of mine and an old friend, so it's good to, uh, good to have a friend back, and again, uh, enjoyed his testimony. I miss uh, serving with him in Congress, but I, he's gone on to bigger and better things, and I just wish him the best for his future. I was asked to come to offer a status update on congressional consideration of the general capital increase for the MDBs. As you know, our subcommittee has been considering legislation to authorize general capital increases for the International Bank Reconstruction and Development, the American Development Bank, the African Development Bank, and the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. The Treasury Department has requested authorization for the U.S. to make these capital increase payments in order to maintain American leadership, and I will emphasize that it's extremely important American leadership at the Multilateral Development Bank, which is important to U.S. economic and national security. As you know, if the U.S. does not increase capital stock in the banks, then the U.S. could lose its leadership position. Our subcommittee convened four hearings on these authorization requests. At our first hearing, we looked at the leadership role of the U.S. at the MDBs. Under Secretary Brainard testified that having a leadership position at an MDB can influence bank policy decisions and in some cases can provide veto power over the decisions that are made. If we do not authorize these funds as requested, the U.S. share will be diminished, impacting our leadership and influence at these institutions. And I will just uh, compliment the Under Secretary. She has been extremely generous with her time, her talents, and her staff. Um, we've worked very closely together to really do what's right for this country. And she has, a, uh, a, again, a wealth of knowledge on this issue. And it's refreshing to meet with her. And she's been extremely cooperative on these issues. Our second hearing was focused on the impact of MDBs on US job creation. And that's a major emphasis for Congress today. We learned about the ways in which MDB financing helps open developing markets. 
which can spur private sector economic growth and employment in the United States. We had a distinguished panel of witnesses to discuss topics, including the Honorable Jim Colby, former member of Congress and chairman of the House Foreign Operations Subcommittee on Appropriations. He is currently a senior transatlantic fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Mr. Robert Mosbacher, Jr., past president and CEO of Overseas Private Investment Corporation. Mr. James A. Harmon, past president and CEO of the Axiom Bank. Mr. Benjamin Leo, former White House National Security Director of African Affairs, now the Center of Global Development. Mr. John Hardy, President of Coalition for Employment Through Exports. Our third hearing focused on how World Bank and MDB's assistance to middle income and poor countries around the world contribute to U.S. national security. We learned about how MDB's assistance helped developing countries become stable nations that can counter, uh, counteract proliferation of terrorism and other threats to the United States. We are honored by Rear Admiral Michelle Howard, Chief of Staff for the Directors of Strategic Plan and Policy for the Joint Chief of Staff. She came to our hearing. It's extremely rare for a senior military officer to appear before our committee. Admiral Howard holds one unique disti distinction that I was very impressed by. She was the first African-American woman to command a ship in the U.S. Navy. Assistant Secretary Marisa Lago, the U.S. Department of Treasury Assistant Secretary for International Markets and Development, also testified at our third hearing. And yesterday we held a fourth hearing. That was the legislative hearing to consider a discussion draft for authorization of the general capital increases. We focused on the consequences of not meeting the U.S. commitment to the MDBs, the impact of U.S. leadership at the MDBs to ensuring that investment helps to safeguard national and economic security, and specific policy derivatives or conditions that should be included in this legislative to preserve U.S. national economic security. As I mentioned, Dan Rundy from CIS and Mark Green testified yesterday, and it was a very good hearing we had. In addition, Eli Whitney, Deborah Voice, and I love the first two names, Eli Whitney, he was a great, great grandson of Eli Whitney, former U.S. Executive Director for the World Bank, and John Murphy from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce provided their expertise and emphasized the benefit on the United States and U.S. jobs here. This hearing process has been an important one, so the subcommittee fully understands the role and the impact of MDBs on U.S. economic and national security. The problem we have in Congress is not many members really understand the benefit of these organizations and how they really provide jobs and security for this country, and we've had distinguished members come before us and explain the benefit of that. While the hearing leaves little doubt, and I will emphasize little doubt, about how critical it is for the U.S. to move forward on schedule with these capital increases, these authorization requests come at a time when Congress is focused on getting our own massive debt under control. The timing is actually less than ideal. They're the first capital increases we have had to consider in almost two decades because they've done a very good job of the capital is funded to them originally. To overcome this, we focused on hearing on helping members to assess the benefit of the MDBs given the current fiscal challenges that are before Congress. The hearing illustrated the U.S. leadership in these institutions is of critical importance. Witnesses made clear that the MDBs are vital to addressing the world's most pressing economic and national security challenges. I've argued that at the time when we are worried about fiscal constraints, the ability of these institutions to leverage limited resources is exactly what's needed at this point in time. Bilateral foreign assistance is under significant strain right now. The MDBs can alleviate this strain by pooling our resources with other funds. The most pressing development in national security issues and needs can be met by doing this. A great example is that one dollar of U.S. that we contribute to the IBRD as a part of general capital increase will result in thirty dollars in development lending. In African Development Bank, it's huge. Every U.S. dollar yields more than seventy dollars in lending. This approach makes fiscal sense, and with U.S. leadership at the institutions, we can ensure that the development support is aligned with U.S. interests, and that's very important. So while we are authorizing spending, I would argue that this is a fiscally responsible approach to meeting our nation's economic and national security needs. If the U.S. does not make these capital increases, the implications are very serious. This is a difficult issue before the critical missions that the MDBs perform in promoting peace and stability, and it's not, and it should be at the forefront of our constituents' minds, but it's not. They don't really understand this. MDBs help foster U.S. national economic security because we have the leadership role in there, and we need to emphasize we do have the leadership role. While we face critical fiscal choices right now, we cannot cede grounds to other countries, and China would love to take our position. They're eager to replace us, and other leaders of other countries are too. If we do not lead, others will, and that's important. If we don't lead, others will. They will set the agenda, 
and the priorities for the MDBs, we won't. I want to thank you for the opportunity to address you today. I'm glad CSI is helping to raise awareness of the critical needs of these general capital increases. I can tell you that it helps with our job on the Hill to have others getting the message out there, and we'd like you to do that. We need to let other members of Congress know the needs and benefit of what we're doing. And I think the Undersecretary has done a tremendous job at reaching out. Um, we've not looked at this as a Democrat administration and Republican congressman. We've looked at this as an issue that's important to this country and an issue need to be resolved. And I look forward to working with her in the future and you. And thank you for having me today. Congressman, thank you so much. Um, I know that you have to be leaving soon to go back to Capitol Hill, but um, we're so fortunate to have you here today. And I'm going to turn the floor over now to Undersecretary Brainerd. Undersecretary. Well, I am uh, delighted to be here, uh, always delighted to be at CSIS, very appreciative uh, to Dan Rundy. Uh, who has been a very active proponent of sustaining leadership uh, for the United States in these institutions. And I uh, look forward to uh, a terrific panel uh, who will follow uh, to speak to these institutions, uh, Julie Katzman, Tony Fratto, Dan Price, and Congressman Mark Green, all of whom um, really have um, a lot of experience with these institutions. I want to say uh, personally how grateful I am to uh, Chairman Miller. Uh, he has been working um, very uh, uh, tirelessly with uh, his uh, ranking member, uh, McCarthy, on this issue. And as he said, uh, this is really a, a great example of how America works when it works best. And I think it's very appropriate uh, on this issue where we have such strong bipartisan support to be talking about it here at CSIS, which really stands for uh, trying to work across the aisle to do what's best for America and what's best for the world. I want to, uh, I want to just uh, start by uh, posing a question. Uh, that really has more to do uh, with Americans um, than uh, directly with the multilaterals, but you'll see, I think, uh, the connection. What do Americans want for their future? I think we know a great deal from recent survey data. I certainly get the same responses when I travel around the country. We know that Americans, first and foremost, seek good jobs, good jobs so that they can provide for their children, they can provide for their families, and they can expand uh, opportunities for this generation and into the future. We also know that Americans want to compete and win in the global economy and believe that being the world's leading economy is well worth the hard work. We know that Americans want to feel that our national security is strong and that we are reducing the causes of war, extremism, and terrorism beyond our borders and thereby protecting our borders. And we know that Americans want to build international support for our values and continue to serve as a beacon for people around the world through our support of democratic transitions and by lending a hand to the world's poorest and to those suffering from disasters and war. And of course, Americans want to do so in a way that's cost effective, maximizes results, and creates strong foundations for growth. This is not a new agenda. These goals have resonated with Americans for generations. Across administrations and across the country, American policymakers and leaders have worked to advance this agenda. And today, as we face a world of constrained resources at home and new challenges and opportunities abroad, we have to look very carefully at what tools, what institutions, what mechanisms best help us achieve those goals while maximizing results for every taxpayer dollar expended. And today, just as was true 60 years ago, when we helped found these institutions, the multilateral development banks are an essential part of that toolkit to foster growth, create jobs, expand opportunity, strengthen national security, and amplify our values. Let me talk about each of those in turn. First, as we work to strengthen our economy here at home, we know that we must see stronger global growth so that we can export more, expand our businesses, hire more workers. The cycle of growth abroad and here at home helps Americans secure the good jobs they desire and build for their future. The MDBs play a vital role in advancing those desires. The MDBs have helped finance the development of the hard infrastructure, the roads, the ports, the railways that get our products to new markets and connect our factories and farms with emerging and developing economy consumers. 
Our businesses recognize the benefits of these multilateral infrastructure investments. I heard this recently firsthand when I was uh, talking to a team at uh, Cargill in Minnesota as they described their expanding international footprint and how critical a role infrastructure plays in getting their products from American farms to the factories and then to consumers and families around the world. The World Bank recently estimated that each additional day a product is delayed between a factory gate and a cargo ship reduces trade by more than 1%. That's why last year alone, the World Bank supported over $8.4 billion worth in transport projects around the world. The MDBs, though, are also vital in establishing the soft infrastructure that is so vital to helping our businesses compete. The rules and regulations that make markets work by reducing trade barriers, improving property rights, and slashing cumbersome red tape. The export numbers tell the story. Over the past decade, our exports to many of the countries that have benefited from these institutions have expanded. Brazil exports have more than doubled. To India, quadrupled. And in some places, Turkey, Colombia, Indonesia, we're growing our exports by more than 200 percent. The MDBs also help to level the playing field. The alternative to MDB financing and infrastructure in many countries, particularly in Africa, is borrowing from countries like China. In contrast, the MDBs have rigorous safeguards that we have worked hard to secure to protect the environment, uphold the rights of vulnerable populations, and combat corruption. And they establish fair and consistent rules that our businesses uh, use to compete. Secondly, uh, as uh, Chairman Miller heard in the hearing where, uh, Admiral, where the Admiral testified, the MDBs are critical for reinforcing and strengthening our national security and helping to deter the causes of extremism and terrorism that Americans seek to thwart. Over the past decade, the MDBs have provided $5.9 billion in reconstruction assistance to conflict countries. In a recent letter to Secretary Geithner, General Petraeus and General McNabb noted the key support of the World Bank and the Asian Development Bank in Afghanistan and called their projects vital to the success of the U.S. strategy in both Afghanistan and the region. They were referring to projects such as the Ring Road and the Uzbek Afghan Railroad, which are rebuilding nearly 2,000 miles of roads so that Afghan security forces can keep the peace as we draw down our own troops by accessing remote regions. These investments in, Afghans, in Afghanistan's stability and reconstruction have generated 2 million days of employment for unskilled laborers and significantly improved crop yields for poor farmers around the country, undermining the recruitment efforts of opium cartels and violent extremists. National security is also at risk following major natural disasters, and the MDBs have been on the front lines, whether it's in Haiti two years ago or the tsunami that struck Aceh, Indonesia in 2004. In Haiti, the Inter-American Development Bank, which Julie is representing today, has provided tens of thousands of households access to potable water and rebuilt schools and roads. Amidst the intense suffering of the Haitian people that I saw when I visited last summer were spots of hope, projects that help get people back to work in garment factories, help generate light using solar lanterns, and help clear rubble and rebuild, all financed by the MDBs. Third, these institutions help us promote our national values and serve as a beacon, supporting nations transitioning to de democratic and open markets. We see that today. The African Development Bank and the European Bank for Reconstruction Development are poised to support the historic transformations from Egypt to Tunisia, and beyond. The success of these transitions will depend on whether democracy delivers on its promise of freedom and opportunity. We know that this potential can be transformed into powerful results. We've seen it happen uh, just several years back thanks to American support of the MDBs. Think back to the major transitions that took place over the period starting in 1988. This period witnessed the fall of communism in Central and Eastern Europe, the emergence of democratic governments and market economies, financial stability restored in Mexico and Asia. Across this intense period of political change, growth and opportunity, and crisis, the World Bank put to work only $420 million from the United States, which was our last capital increase in 1988 more than 20 years ago, which enabled in the intervening period $325 billion in development investments. This, I think, helps point out the final 
point that I would make just about the leverage and the results that these institutions produce and why our leadership matters. Our investments through the multilateral development banks provide a greater return for U.S. taxpayer dollar than any other foreign assistance investment. Our contributions to all of these institutions together accounts for only 5% of the overall U.S. foreign assistance budget, but each year mobilizes funds that total more than one and a half times that entire account. This leverage matters greatly in today's intense budget environment. No one nation, no matter how powerful, can meet all of today's challenges alone. Through the burden sharing arrangements we negotiate in the multilateral development banks, the other countries that also have strong interests in these goals pay their fair share and multiply each dollar that American taxpayers invest. But of course the numbers are only part of the story and Congressman Miller alluded to that. At the World Bank we currently have a veto over changes to the article of agreement which preserves our leadership and also important reforms on things like procurement, on anti-corruption, on safeguards. At the African Development Bank, we have our own board seat and can influence regional development in places like Egypt and Tunisia. Other nations, like China, are very eager to take up our shares in any of these institutions if we fail to meet our commitments. When we originally helped to create, and we were, centrally the shapers of these institutions at their inception 60 years ago. We did so in order to reduce trade imbalances, blunt communism and economic nationalism, restore growth, and assist countries undergoing transitions. Today we still need these institutions. The world is vastly different today than it was in the 1940s. We face greater competition to our influence and ideas. We have to husband our resources more carefully and we confront a different set of threats that are perhaps more complex. But that makes our support for these institutions more important than ever. It was President Reagan in 1988 who advocated for the last general capital increase for the World Bank that year, but it was a Democratic Congress that approved it. Today with Chairman Miller's leadership and the bipartisan uh, coalition that he has formed, and with the panel that will follow, you can see that bipartisan legacy thrive. And I thank you very much for the work that all of you are doing here today, and hope that you will help us as we seek to continue America's investments in these vital institutions. Thank you. Chairman, a second to take up. Thank you very Thank much you for, for being here. Thank you. <laughs> Under Secretary Brainerd is kind enough to, to, to be available for a, a couple uh, Q and A's. So I'm going to do this World Bank style, having worked at the World Bank. So we're going to group three questions together, and then uh, the Under Secretary can then answer them in, um, in the order that she would like. So we have microphones here. So I'll, if people want to raise their hand, they can na name and uh, also in the form of a question, in the form of a brief question, right? So we want to model brief questions, please. So the gentleman in the front, uh, the woman yes, there, sir. and then the gentleman in it's the middle room. So, okay, sir. I'm Dr. George Alula. I'm an entrepreneur uh, from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, I just want to ask a question uh, which is relating to the situation in this country, very rich in uh, natural resource, they say that we have 23 trillion of gold reserve known and unexploited. So my question is, is on the form of why the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is ongoing a genocide there, cannot benefit in a kind of Marshall Plan uh, like uh, the European continent benefited in 1947-54. The defense, it will not be a Marshall Plan like, like it was in the past, only supported by the U.S., but today we imagine a situation, a solution which uh, for 140 billion this country can be rebuilt uh, by putting together the U.S. leadership and the G8, G20 countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you. Okay, the, the, the woman there. We'll thank you. I'm Karen Ornstein with Friends of the Earth. Sorry, uh, thank you for your uh, talk. Um, I had a question. Um, I think you've painted a very uh, positive picture of, of the World Bank and the MDBs. And I think a lot of, and 
a lot of the changes that have been in place at, for example, the World Bank have come through the power of the purse, namely safeguards, inspection panel, etc. And so, uh, but now we see safeguards, procurement policies, anti-corruption, very much under attack with a program for results, which the new lending instrument that they want to rush through that would potentially leave less than 10% of bank lending subject to these important safeguards and policies. And we see the World Bank talking a lot about energy access, but if you look at their energy lending portfolio, you know, between uh, 2009 and 2010, 0% of their fossil fuel financing went towards energy access, and they have an exponential increase in energy finance between 2006 and 2010. So my question is, is if most of the gains we've achieved at the bank have been achieved through the power of the purse, through congressional leverage, why would we squander this important opportunity to change the direction of the bank when it's in serious need of reform on energy financing, when they're trying to plow through this uh, program for results lending? Um, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And the gentleman there. Thank you. I'm Alessandro Pio, the head of the Asian Development Bank Office in Washington, D.C. You mentioned two topics, the importance of U.S. strategic interest and the leverage that these funds generate. In the case of Afghanistan, for example, where their reconstruction following the transition will be critical, Afghanistan is actually not using general capital funds, but soft funds like the Asian Development Fund in our case. And there also there is an important leverage because the U.S. only contributes about 10 percent of the total pool, so out of the billion dollars spent in Afghanistan, only about 100 million was U.S. funds in the last four years. To what extent is there an appreciation for the need to also complement the capital increase with soft funds for the same purposes in the countries that are conflict affected or the needed the most? Thank Dad, you. I got you all the easy ones under secretary, so I'm sorry about the, um, so I'll, Thank you. Um, so why don't I take them in uh, reverse order. Um, as uh, my comments today really were um, encompassing um, both uh, the general capital increases, which uh, take place once every 20 years or so, where that capital just keeps on working over the subsequent two decades, as well as the leverage ratios that were mentioned of 1 to 28, for instance, for IDA, the soft loan windows, uh, which are on uh, somewhat more concessional terms and are very important in places such as Afghanistan. Um, what I will simply say there is I think there uh, is strong bipartisan support both for the capital increases as well as for IDA, um, African Development Fund, uh, the concessional windows of each of these institutions. And what we've done in this last set of negotiations around the general capital increase, where we do have some leverage, is to um, strengthen the financing model of each institution so that there are flows that are coming off the lending to, uh, the, to the hard loan uh, window that then get cycled back into uh, the soft loan uh, window. So as you, I think, are pointing out, um, the U.S. gets even greater returns for its funding uh, because of the financing model that we've worked out and the pricing on the loans, which means that there is a return so that the poorer countries really benefit from that. So we think in each institution, uh, IDB, um, African Development Bank, Asian Development Bank, World Bank, EBRD is a little different, um, that there is now a financing model which really encompasses our goals as a nation, which is to make sure that countries that are borrowing uh, from the hard loan window with slightly better uh, economic uh, prospects are then plowing that money back uh, partly to the concessional window, and, uh, and that's helping to leverage our taxpayer funding. With regard to energy, all I can say is that we've used our leverage extremely effectively, and the bank, I think senior bank management is very committed to greening their energy portfolio, to energy access, to renewables. And, you know, we see that, obviously, we have a, uh, these are institutions that have um, membership from all around the world, and so these are negotiated uh, processes. But we have seen uh, both with the core resources uh, of the World Bank and with the uh, SIFs, the climate investment funds that sit alongside them and um, help uh, multiply the impact of their green energy investments, that there's a very strong commitment. We have, uh, at the U.S. Treasury, uh, as you know, promulgated a new energy policy, which really um, puts very tough constraints on our own uh, support for energy projects, moving them much more over to the renewables. And we're looking very hard at some of the proposals that you mentioned, P4R, for instance, and making sure that it in no way 
uh, undermines any safeguards. Indeed, uh, that to the extent that programs like that go forward, that they are very carefully designed to ensure those safeguards are multiplied and they are actually uh, increasingly um, seen in the actual uh, domestic processes of some of these countries. And finally, with regard to questions about a Marshall Plan in uh, post-conflict uh, environments, obviously the multilaterals um, can play a very important role in bringing uh, resources to bear in a post-conflict environment. Uh, they also play a very important role in some cases uh, in helping uh, to um, contribute to forces that will prevent conflict. But of course, they need to be lending or uh, making grants or providing technical assistance into an environment uh, where that assistance will be well used. And at that juncture, I think they can play a really uh, critical role as they did, for instance, in Liberia. And, and we look forward to their being able to do that with uh, international support um, as conflict uh, is resolved. Great, we have to, uh, unfortunately, we have to move on. I wanna honor the undersecretary's schedule and we're gonna move on now to, a, to the panel discussion. So please join me in thanking Undersecretary Brainerd for being with us. <laughs> I'm gonna ask my uh, my panelist colleagues to join me up here. Thank you. Okay, as we're getting uh, getting the uh, name tents set up, I'll just uh, make a couple introductory remarks and just say that I think what you've heard from two uh, very distinguished uh, leaders on this issue, and now we're going to have a chance to go a little bit deeper and understand what the consequences are of, of not participating in the general capital increase, but also what the contributions are of the multilateral development banks are to, uh, to U.S. national interest and to development more broadly. Uh, we have a very distinguished panel um, representing uh, folks from the multilateral uh, world, also folks from prior administrations, uh, and voices from de international development. So we're, uh, we're very, very fortunate. Um, you each have their biographies in front of you, so I won't go through, through them. Um, but I'm going to ask each of the panelists to make a, a, a several minute opening uh, statement or uh, make a comment or share their perspective on this topic and then we'll have a discussion and then we'll open it up for, for Q&A. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand the floor over to Julie Katzman. Julie. Well, thank you, Dan, and thank you to you and CIS for inviting me here to talk about multilateral development banks and national security and the importance of the general capital increases and why they're a good investment for the United States. You know, the best way I find uh, to tell this story is to have people come visit our projects. However, that's a little bit impractical today, so you're going to have to make do with the words that I've got, and hopefully I can transport you to a couple of places to see some of the work that we do. I'm the Executive Vice President and Chief Operating Officer of the Inter-American Development Bank. So I'm the designated practitioner on the panel, and I'll try to be a little bit concrete about the kinds of things that we do. And I thought, um, much as, as both uh, Chairman Miller and Lael commented about Haiti, that I would start with Haiti where the IDB is the leading source of multilateral development assistance in the country. And as a result of the GCI, we have a 10-year commitment to make $200 million of grants to Haiti over the next 10 and a half years for a total of $2.1 billion. Now, some have defined delusion as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. And I think it's fair to ask why we expect a different outcome in Haiti this time. And the general capital increase is a big part of the answer as to why we do, in fact, expect a different outcome. And that's that we have this multi-year, 10-year, consistent commitment 
that allows us to plan, it allows us to take, undertake capacity building and follow through with the kinds of investments that take many years to come to fruition. And the second is, related to that, the sectors that we're playing in. The IDB's focus is on six sectors, but two that are really what we see as game changers in the context of Haiti going forward. The first is education, where today, 35% of primary age school children, or 600,000 children, are not in school. And to change that requires a complete change of the way in which education is delivered in Haiti, from the financial model to the infrastructure to teacher training. And together with the government of Haiti, the IDB has worked on a new education program that's being supported by a multitude of donors and will change that set of realities on the ground. The second is in the private sector and the private sector development that we're doing. And the cornerstone of that development from the IDB perspective is the development of an industrial park in the north of Haiti, together with the U.S. government. That industrial park, which already has its anchor tenants, will employ 20,000 new people in the garment sector in Haiti. That compares to about 15,000 garment sector jobs in Haiti as a country today. The more we create economic opportunity on the ground in Haiti, the less we see immigration from Haiti to U.S. shores. And that's a direct impact on national security. Now, all of this requires the GCI. The U.S.'s participation in the GCI is $102 million per year for five years. $102 million paid in to the IDB, $200 million paid out by the IDB just to Haiti in grants. Over five years, the U.S. pays its contribution of $510 million, and over 10.5 years, we pay $2.1 billion out to Haiti. That's four times leverage on that money. That's just the Haiti piece of the GCI. In addition, the IDB is able to double its lending to the region, which means more people leaving poverty, more consumers being created, increase in merchandise exports to the region. And last, there is a whole host of reforms, whoever was asking that question earlier, that the U.S. has used its significant influence to put into place in the context of the GCI. I'm going to tell one other piece of a story, and let's go to Mexico. So if I say Haiti, you say earthquake. And if I say Mexico, you say Zetas, probably today, or drug cartels. Um, but there's so much more than that going on on the ground in Mexico today. And I'll take you to a July 5th New York Times article, which pointed out that emigration from Haiti to the United States is at a 40-year low. And that's important because six out of every 10 illegal immigrants in the United States are from Mexico. So why is that happening? Well, the article goes on to say that there's a growing body of evidence suggesting that a mix of developments in Mexico, including expanding economic and educational opportunities and shrinking families, are suppressing illegal traffic as much as immigrant slowdowns or immigrant crackdowns in the United States. These expanding economic and educational opportunities are exactly the kinds of things that the IDB has been investing in for the last 10 or 15 years. In education, that's innovative programs that have increased advancement to grade level on time through conditional cash transfers, that have increased attendance, particularly of girls, that have increased investments in, in school infrastructure, and have done things like testing financial incentives to increase and improve outcomes. It's an improvement in infrastructure to small towns all over Mexico so that people have water and sanitation and electricity. And it's support to small and medium-sized enterprises in Mexico. So if I translate that into some of the specifics that were in the article, in Jalisco, which is the state that brings you tequila, and there's a boom in Jalisco as a result of the tequila boom, let me just say. And we've supported the, the tequila growers. The number of high schools between 2000 and 2009 has doubled in Jalisco to over 700 high schools. And 13 of those are science campuses, dedicated science campuses. And the outgrowth of that is that one of the people in the article said, 18-year-old, I'm not going to the United States because I'm more concerned about my studies. And that's an amazing change. The number of professionals with bachelor's degrees or more has doubled from, from 400,000 to 800,000. And this is true in the poor states in Mexico, like Chiapas and, and Oaxaca in the south, where the professional degree holders have also doubled from 250,000 to 500,000 plus. This is similar to the other, in the other 26 countries in the region where we work, 
where those who have escaped poverty number 40 million over the last decade. The wealthier we make this region, the more secure we make the United States. So quick thing on why is this good business for the United States, the capital increase. First, we make money. We made $800 million last year at the operating income level. Second, this is an investment. Our loans, as evidenced by our operating income, are repaid with interest. No government has ever defaulted to the, to the IDB. Third, for every dollar that the U.S. has invested in the IDB, $1.35 has returned to the United States in disbursements to U.S. companies. Fourth, we're a key partner, as Lael and Chairman Miller said, to promote economic liberty and strengthen democracy and institutions throughout the region. And last, we are the second largest merchandise export market of the United States in Latin America and the Caribbean. $300 billion of exports in 2010, second only to the EU and more than three times the level of China. And last, let me conclude with what happens if we don't have the GCI. Well, the IDB is unique. Our charter does not allow the United States to be diluted. Our, our, our speakers earlier commented on if these capital increases go forward without the United States, the U.S. loses its percent ownership. Well, in our case, the capital increase does not happen. So what that means from an economic perspective is we have to cut back our lending by approximately 50 percent when we're on the verge of a very fragile worldwide economy. And the grants to Haiti, not likely to happen. Second, and perhaps more importantly from a political perspective, this would have a serious effect on U.S. standing in the region and would create an opening for proponents of alternative financial institutions, which arguably have much lower levels of safeguards and have a different political agenda than that of the United States. And last, as was alluded to earlier, there are countries who are investing heavily in the region, who are looking at more influence, more markets, and a greater way to exert their presence in the world. So, for all of these reasons, and many more that I hope we get a chance to discuss on the panel, we at the IDB are very hopeful not only that Congress supports the GCI through its authorization legislation, but that it fully funds the IDB's capital contribution. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Am Ambassador Green. Thanks, Dan, uh, and, and thanks for having me, and it's always an honor to be here at CSIS. Uh, I'm Mark Green, uh, currently Senior Director at the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition. Uh, USGLC represents a wide range of uh, entities from major corporations like Caterpillar and Walmart to humanitarian NGOs like CARE and World Vision. Uh, we are a coalition of foreign policy, military, faith-based leaders in every state all of whom come together behind the simple concept that we need to support American engagement and we need to support our civilian tools of diplomacy and development, of which the MDBs are a, a crucial part. And I'll try not to be repetitive uh, from what uh, Julie and Dan have said. And, and uh, like Julie, I look forward to, uh, to addressing some of your questions. You know, first off, it, it goes without saying that members of Congress, both sides of the aisle, both houses, have tough choices ahead of them. This isn't easy. I think we all know that. And I really want to tip my hat to Chairman Miller. We were elected together back in 1998. But uh, this is difficult work. In the context of the fiscal and political challenges that, uh, that we're facing, for a leader like Chairman Miller and the ranking member, Congresswoman McCarthy, to go to bat and to push real hard to do what is, I believe, the right thing to do from a policy perspective, that's real gumption, and I think they deserve our, our gratitude. Uh, I'd like to offer um, a handful of reasons why I think this is in America's interest, with a particular emphasis on security, because I believe that any objective analysis uh, of these questions w will lead us there to that. First off, my own view is that this is simply put an obligation of leadership. Uh, this is what the Amer uh, America as uh, a, a global leader needs to do. In the general sense, uh, the rest of the world looks to us and looks to our leadership and the projection of values that our policy choices, including our budgetary choices, express. In the particular sense, uh, the United States, through its leadership in many of these uh, multilateral development banks, has played a role in encouraging those institutions to step forward 
to help rebuild and repair, whether it be in Haiti, whether it be in, in uh, North Africa. You know, we have encouraged and helped these institutions to step forward to do the right thing and to make a profound difference. And it would be troubling, I would say, that um, at the very time those institutions now need us to step forward and to help with replenishment, if we were somehow to step back and step away, um, I think that would be dangerous for those institutions and send precisely the wrong message. Second reason is what my staff refers to as the dance with the one who brought you argument. I think history shows us that as developing nations emerge, they tend to reflect uh, the values, the institutions of those uh, organizations and uh, nations that help them get there. And as we see uh, rapid development and emergence taking place in regions like sub-Saharan Africa, the fact that the U.S. through both the international affairs budget and the broad range of development and diplomacy programs and its support for the MDBs, uh, I think uh, it's in our interest for those emerging nations to develop procedures and institutions that reflect our values, our values being capitalism, private investment, transparency, anti-corruption, rule of law, all of those things that our entrepreneurs need in order to be able to invest and succeed, but also, again, is sort of our view of the world, the way that uh, countries should develop. Uh, and, and so our support for all of these programs, including the MDBs, is very, very important from that standpoint. As others have said, uh, there are alternatives out there to American engagement and uh, uh, American leadership and the MDBs. There are alternative sources of funding. I think we all believe it is in our interest if those nations emerge, um, you know, trying to tap into the model that has succeeded in, in the West and been so important. Third, um, I believe there's value in the partnerships that we build, not just partnerships with the, um, um, the nations that are receiving the benefits of the loans and, in some cases, grants, but also in the cooperation and burden sharing that takes place among donor nations. This is one of those areas in which we are building affirmative, positive relationships and partnerships that are helping to define world fortunes. That's a good thing. That's good for the U.S. Um, and I guess I'll close with this and, and, and you know, wait for questions. I think the most important reason from a national security standpoint is when we take a look at the threats uh, that are emerging in this world, and what the great threats are to our national security, we recognize in many cases it's not the traditional clash of major powers the state versus state conflict risk that we saw for so many years, for decades, that, that I grew up with, we're also uh, looking at um, weak states and failing states as being states from which uh, danger can emerge. Uh, while poverty does not cause terrorism, and we need to be very clear in that and say it over and over again, we also have to recognize that abject poverty, uh, true destitution, is a condition which sometimes leads to despair, and that despair can be a condition that extremists seek to exploit. If we can be involved, if we can be playing a leadership role in addressing those conditions that can lead to despair, good for us. And if we can be seen as doing it, even better for us. That is in our interest, and I believe that is a matter of, uh, of national security. Secre former Secretary of State Rice put it very well a couple of weeks ago in a speech that she gave where she equated, um, uh, in modern times, the distribution of bed nets to fight malaria, and by the way, the World Bank is the third largest funder of bed nets in the world, to GIs passing out candy to children in Germany shortly after World War II. And, and I thought that that parallel, that image, was a fitting one because it is also um, building our brand, if you will. It is polishing up our image, and I think we all agree that's positive in this world today. Thanks, Ambassador Green. I'm going to hand the floor over to Tony Fratto. Tony. Thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. And um, 
you know, first, I just want to associate myself with the, actually the, the comments that everyone made, but especially, um, uh, you know, Gary Miller and, and Lael Brainerd, who are two just remarkable leaders in trying to get uh, get this done, and 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 probably have you know one of the most if you think of uh, you know the most difficult job in Washington uh, today, think of what they're trying to do is to spend more money uh, overseas and put it in the hands of international organizations, right? I mean. Could there be a more difficult uh, job in Washington today in the current economic and, and fiscal uh, environment that we're, that we're dealing with? And, and they haven't um, uh, shied away from that challenge. And I suspect one of the reasons is that they, they know a little bit more about what the, what the multilateral development banks are doing and accomplishing than, uh, than others do. I, I um, <coughs> occasionally get, uh, you know, usually on my, on, my, on my Twitter feed, get, uh, um, you know, accused of being the you know the soft-headed Republican on uh, international uh, you know global health and development uh, issues, and you know he's, he's, he's pro uh, immigration, he's pro spending on on, uh, on on foreign assistance and emergency um, uh, health and uh, and food programs, and you know so you know maybe you don't want to trust him, and um, and what you know maybe some of that is. Uh, is true. Maybe, maybe I am a little bit, uh, you know, soft-headed on on the need for it, uh, but I'm actually, um, you know, actually very hard-headed on the way the multilateral development banks work and function and the effectiveness of their programs. And it's actually because of my hard-headedness from an economic standpoint why I support where the MDBs are today and the work that. Uh, that they're doing, and you know, so you see, we we have seen um, in recent years uh, criticism of uh, of the model that uh, that the World Bank and the World Bank Group uh, and bilateral uh, development um, uh, programs uh, have been have employed, you know, over the past 50 years. You know, people like Bill Easterly, and you know, uh, more recently, Dembi Moyo and some others, uh, you know, very, very critical of the work that, um, uh, and the, the effectiveness of international development programs. And sometimes I look at that and I see their point, um, but most of their point uh, is focused on, a, uh, on, a, uh, on an MDB model that we don't actually have today. Um, but it's one that we've had before, and where development, uh, bilateral development programs in particular, were once before. And so what we've seen over the last uh, 10 to 15 years is a remarkable uh, transformation in the way the MDBs work, the way they administer their programs, the way they uh, collaborate um, multilateral and, uh, and uh, between multilateral uh, programs and, and bilateral uh, development assistance agencies on their uh, burden sharing, on their uh, on their uh, uh, focus uh, to avoid redundancies, on uh, robust um, measuring of results, on transparency, on governance, on across all of these areas that we consider critical to the effectiveness of international development, we've seen. Uh, uh, enormous improvements uh, among the, the multilateral development banks. And if you think of the criticism, if you're thinking about the United States and support for these programs, what the criticism is, uh, it's based on those old conceptions of what, what the banks are doing. It is that they are, uh, that they're wasteful, that they finance corruption, uh, that they're, you know, that they're redundant, that we don't see results, they're not transparent, uh, and all of those things have improved, but that's not a story that's been told here, and it's, it is not at all well understood, uh, certainly not among the American people, uh, and, um, and most concerning, not among uh, the, you know, uh, many members of Congress who are making financing decisions uh, for the banks, so uh, I, I, you know, I don't want to go too long. I really want to get into uh, questions and, and what we can do about what we can do about that, and and what, you know how critical it is. I mean, um, uh, you know, Congressman Green talked about um, 
the, uh, you know, what was the dance with the, the dance with the one who brought you, you know, and I think maybe, like maybe the, mm -hmm. you know, the flip side of that is, uh, of that, of that record, um, we, we're old enough to remember records. Um, there was a B side, you know, so if you can't be with the one you're with, love, or if, you, if you can't, if you can't, uh, be with the one you love, love the one you're with, right? And so we can make a national security argument that, you know, uh, if you, especially in Africa, you know, if they can't be with the one they love, which they, you look at the highest ratings for, uh, of uh, support for any country in the world, you go to Africa, and, and, and the reputation of America and Africa is, ex is extremely high, higher than anywhere else in the world, but they're dancing with um, the one they're with, and that's China right now, because China's coming in with a lot of cash and no strings, uh, and so that's a, there are, there are uh, uh, you know, diplomatic concerns for the United States, national security concerns for the United States, there are American leadership concerns for the United States. As Julie talked about, there are commercial uh, interest for the United States. All of those interests are uh, are are really important, um, but I go back to just the question of of effectiveness because I think the American people, and I think our, our record shows this, are uh, it, we, we have we have uh, created the most generous um, you know society, um, probably in the history of mankind, giving in all kinds of different ways, philanthropic dollars are, uh, you know, are just at, at, uh, at very, very high levels, and that's even setting aside the, um, the uh, uh, official uh, programs. So, uh, but I think if you can show the American people uh, that there are results, uh, that their money is being used wisely, that it's having an impact, the American people will want to be generous and they will support those kinds of programs. PEPFAR is an example of a program that um, most, in, most in the world and many in this country would not have expected to see such strong bipartisan support for. But PEPFAR was uh, and is exceedingly effective at doing is showing results for uh, uh, um, you know, American financing. Right, they can show actual numbers. They can they can count the number of people who are alive today. They can count and are very very uh, committed to counting and showing those numbers of the number of people they help and the number of people who are alive today. And so you see bipartisan support and you see general support from the American people for a program like that. We need to do it with a lot of our other programs and start telling uh, the the uh, the success story of. Uh, of multilateral development bank programs, how that money is being uh, is being spent wisely, and the uh, and the greater return, all of all of those uh, the issues that we talked about, and the, but the greater return on uh, on that investment for the American people, and I think they'll be uh, supportive and they'll support members of Congress who have the courage to go out there and and back these programs. Thank you, thank you Tony. I'm going to hand the floor over now to Dan Price. Dan. Thank you very much, Dan, and thanks to CSIS for organizing this important event. Uh, uh, like Tony, uh, I agree with uh, virtually everything that was said by the speakers <laughs> before me, uh, which makes my job easier. I don't have to say much. Uh, let me just say this. To me, the question of whether the United States will fund these capital contributions boils down to this. Will the United States agree with the America in declinists that you see on virtually every op-ed page here and in Europe? Or will the United States maintain its engagement and a leadership position in global affairs? To me, that's really it. It is self-evidently in the interest of the United States to promote global economic growth, to promote democracies rather than theocracies, to promote accountable governments and the rule of law. And these multilateral development banks, in particular, through their technical assistance programs, do just that. They provide advice in establishing regulatory regimes, uh, in establishing uh, ministries, 
uh, the uh, mechanisms of government that promote accountability, that promote transparency. L let me give a concrete example of what in some countries was regarded as a revolutionary concept that's universally supported by the MDBs. And that is the notion that when you apply for a permit or a license or a permission from government and it denies you, it must give reasons. It must give a response within a particular time limit. And the individual denied has a right to appeal, to appeal to an authority other than the one who denied him the license. The support of these organizations for private sector development as opposed to state-oriented or state-controlled economies is also critical. One of the interesting things that those of you who follow the Soviet Union and the post-Soviet world may have noticed is that as soon as private ownership was allowed, the demand for home improvement and people actually caring about the places that they lived in spiked dramatically. There's a debate, particularly since the financial and economic crisis, as to whose model works, whether it is the private sector, market-oriented, democratic model, messy as that is, flawed as it sometimes is, as in need of repair, as we can acknowledge, or the other model. And there are lots of proponents of the other model who enjoy significant surpluses and are ready to step in as we step back. I won't repeat all the arguments uh, that others have stated eloquently, uh, but again, to me, it's a very simple question as to how the United States conceives of itself, of its role in the world, and its responsibilities. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. I'm going to take advantage of being the moderator and ask a couple questions. I'm going to ask one specifically to Julie, and then I'm going to ask one to the, to the other panelists. And so I'll, I'll put them out there so you both can, can think about them. You won't have as much time to think yeah, about no, it, but sorry. See that. So you can see that coming. But um, this issue of our ability as the United States to impose rules of the game or standards, if you could think of an example where the United States has, in the case of the IDB, pushed a certain line, a policy line, that if we weren't there, if we didn't have a leadership role, wouldn't have happened and why that would have been a bad thing, if you could think about that. And then I guess the question for my, my other colleagues on the uh, on the panel, as I, I'm thinking of Ambassador Green's from Wisconsin, I'm thinking about, I have a, I'm from a very large family and I have many aunts and uncles that live in Wisconsin. They pay taxes, they're patriotic Americans, they go to church on Sundays, they uh, believe in American leadership in the world. If each of you could just think about, not in think tank terms, but think in terms of uh, Thanksgiving table terms, if you were talking to my aunt and uncle in Wausau, Wisconsin about this, um, if you could just think about what would be your clever, what would be your, your simple, respectful, but, but clever way of phrasing this, because I think members of Congress, I think, need some help in terms of thinking about this. And when they go home to town hall meetings, so, I mean, I get paid to, to think of sophisticated ways to frame this and sound smart about this, but I'm not quite sure that that, that translates to the Thanksgiving table. So I would like to ask the other three panelists to think about what if you were at a Thanksgiving table in, in, in middle America where this is going to matter or a, or a town hall meeting and you were a member of Congress and you were going to raise your hand and say, I believe in this, what are the, what are the two or three bumper sticker things you'd say that are respectful of the, of the questioning of it but do it in a way that, that is maybe not, not, not in think tank talk, I guess is how I'd frame it. So I guess that does give you a second, Julie, to, to think about it because I gave you a, it gave long, long answer, Nicely long question. Done. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, okay, so, so I'd say first, um, environmental safeguards, right? So it's, it's certainly the case that there are other countries in the world who care about environmental safeguards, and I don't mean to imply otherwise, but um, the U.S. has clearly been uh, at the forefront of 
making sure that the safeguard regime as it relates to sustainability as a whole, not just the environment, but, but uh, biodiversity, gender, et cetera, have those kinds of reforms and requirements have been put in place early and they've been strengthened continuously as we go. Now, then taking a, a slight twist on that, which is, for example, in our capital increase, one of the requirements is that 25% of our lending be for climate change by 2015. And that also is something that was very high on the U.S.'s agenda. Um, in the, in, a, in another one of those was 20% of our lending in the private sector, toward private sector development. So I think those are things that the U.S.'s fingerprints are on very dramatically. In the less sexy, less Thanksgiving table orientation, yeah. um, the U.S. was adamant, and, and Lael alluded to this, about sustainability of the institution. So as a part of our capital increase, there's a requirement that 90% of our administrative budget be covered by loan charges. So to ensure that that income that's going to fund other things like the less developed countries and the soft windows is available because it's not being used to backfill administrative budget. And that was something, again, that is a little bit more esoteric, but very much led by the United States. Thank you. Ambassador? Yeah, I don't know if I have a bumper sticker, but, um, you know, look, we use Wisconsin as, uh, as the example. Um, you know, we have and by the way, they're Packer fans. It, as well. And they are Packer fans, as everyone should be, of course. Um, but you know, in, in Wisconsin, we have manufacturers like Trek and Harley Davidson and Oshkosh Truck and S. C. Johnson. Uh, we're farm country. My in-laws are farmers, and it's corn and soybeans. What unites all of them is uh, the understanding, the appreciation that 95 percent of the world's population lives outside the United States. And if Foshkosh Truck or my father-in-law, the soybean farmer, can't have access to markets overseas, they're out of business. My father-in-law should plow those fields under and Oshkosh Truck Miles will close the doors. So the question becomes, how are we going to increase the ability of American entrepreneurs to compete in these emerging markets? In sub-Saharan Africa, projected growth rates are two, three, and four times greater than domestic markets. What we're talking about is support for institutions that are helping to lay that foundation, that are creating the conditions that our entrepreneurs need in order to compete. It's not just a, a trade deal that they're looking for. They're looking for institutions that promote rule of law, transparency, time limits on, on permitting requests. If we're able to get those things done, and I think the MDBs play a key role in helping that happen, our entrepreneurs will compete and, quite frankly, will succeed in any market. But unless we are in there supporting those institutions that make those changes, we will see that 95 percent of the world's population, uh, you know, perhaps gravita gravitating towards some of our competitors. And that would be bad for our job creators. Thanks. Tony? Yeah, so, so uh, Mark, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's one of my favorite you know, statistics, right, 95 percent of uh, the world's population. Uh, out there, that means that's you know that that's our uh, those are our potential markets, and I look at that and I say, okay, now now imagine if half of uh, that 95 percent lack the means, right, to to actually buy, where they could have, you know where if they they could even have the the, the, the appropriate uh, laws. You go to Africa, you know Africa has uh, now. I think uh, 730 uh, bilateral investment treaties with other governments, you know, to protect the interests of investors in uh, in Africa. D Dan is an expert and can tell me whether they're, you know, which ones are, are really strong and, and uh, beneficial or not. But at least, you know, you see that Africa moving in the right direction. We're right? thinking about its investment climate. But if you have half of that 95 percent lacking the means to buy those products produced in uh, in Oshkosh, and uh, then um, then, uh, you know, it's not a question of access to the market as much as it is just, uh, you know, the ability of those um, economies to, to purchase uh, and trade uh, with uh, the things that you, you know, that where we have a comparative uh, advantage. So if I'm sitting across, you know, the Thanksgiving table, um, you know, there some people don't quite see the benefits of trade, so you may have to convince them on, um, uh, on the benefits of, uh, of trade and grow markets, but where I 
start with some people's, I just asked this, you know, sort of a simple counterfactual um, <coughs> question, historical question, that is, you know, do you think the world is a better place uh, for having the economic engine of the United States of America, right? Is the world generally better off economically as a you know, global growth um, for the emergence in the last century, or two centuries ago now, is uh, of the United States as a uh, enormous engine of growth in the global economy? And I think, you know, pretty much any uh, rational observer would say, of course. So then, why would it not be in our interest to create? more United States of Americas out there, um, not in our you know, identical image as you know, free democracies, although we'd like to see that, and our commitment to capitalism, although we'd like to see that. But just as an economic engines, would the world be better off if we multiplied the numbers of United States of Americas out there as economic engines? And I think the answer is unquestionably yes for every citizen of the world. So let's get on with it. Thanks, Tony. Dan? Uh, two points. First, on your question about examples of uh, a different approaches taken uh, by MDBs or by other funders, I'll give you a concrete example. This was at a time when the United States was seeking to normalize trade relations with Vietnam. And virtually every development assistance organization in the world was sending people to Hanoi. Uh, I went there uh, uh, funded by a uh, market-oriented, US-oriented uh, development organization. But I wasn't the only one there. And on the issue, again, a concrete example, the issue of import licensing and import monopolies. That is, should a state assign a single entity, state-owned or privately owned, to have the monopoly right to import a particular class of goods? Or should the importation of goods be subject to an import licensing regime administered by a single entity? My view was, not surprisingly, no. No, there shouldn't be import monopolies. There should be competition. There shouldn't be this import licensing regime that kind of shares economic rents. Again, it should be based on competition. That was not the view taken by one of my co-panelists at this session, funded uh, by an organization from a country with a different point of view. Closed economies concentrate economic power, whether in the hands of the state or in private sector oligarchs. That's not good. That was the concrete example. Thanksgiving table, uh, I would say this. Prosperous societies make better customers for the United States, number one. And stable societies, hopeful societies, not you know, riven with despair, means fewer Americans <coughs> being put in harm's way to maintain the peace. Thank you very much. Uh, the audience has been very, uh, very patient. I'm going to call on a couple people. We'll do it in bank style. So I'm going to call on my friend in the back row here, the lady back here, my friend Bob Berg, and then the lady over here. We'll do it in that, that order. Uh, yep. Just a quick comment going back to your question about where was U U.S. leadership particularly important at the MDBs. Um, over the past two decades, U.S. leadership on the anti-corruption issue has been absolutely pivotal. Uh, and while nobody uh, ever supported corruption, uh, I think without U.S. leadership, we wouldn't have the progress we've had, and it's been considerable uh, at the MDBs. And as a former, there was a question raised earlier um, about lending for results. Uh, it's a rather arcane issue, but I think what was important about it is to point out that the threats to progress still exist. Uh, there are forces within these institutions that would like to roll it back uh, for competitive advantage and for other reasons. And so continued U.S. leadership, I think, is vitally important, as it is more generally on anti-corruption. Some of your panelists have been uh, really uh, very important to putting and keeping the corruption issue on the anti-corruption, on the international agenda, G8, G20, 
uh, and so forth. So I think when you're talking to people about both development effectiveness and also um, clean and um, hospitable operating environments for U.S. business, continued U.S. leadership at these institutions is vital. Thank you very much. Maybe we'll, we'll ask the panelists to just, just comment on that issue of corruption after they, we hear from the other two. My friend, Mr. Berg. Thank you very much. Um, w when I was uh, uh, trying to think of arguments for the Hill, when I was in the Coolidge administration at AID, <laughs> uh, I uh, uh, often found that uh, by admitting that we had challenges and uh, difficulties, uh, that we got away from claiming to be Wisconsin-y, uh, that our herd was the only one that gave all cream. Um, and I'm wondering if you were writing legislation on the Hill now, what new powers might you want these institutions to have or issues that you're worried about that you wish they were addressing? Because I do believe that we have to approach the Hill with a realistic notion that all institutions need improvement. Um, and while we're proud of the MDBs, that we want to be good friends to them and help them overcome f these and future challenges. Thank you, Bob. I actually will jump in on that one as well. And I'm going to actually just be, uh, ask the indulgence of the third woman, woman over here. I'm going to ask um, if, if my, my friend could call in Claire Moran, who's back here, who's the DFID representative here in the United States. Claire, please, why don't you go next? I'm going to ask you to go next, and then there, I call, there's a woman over here, and then we'll, we'll have another round of questions as well. Claire, please go ahead. Uh, thanks for a really excellent panel. I think you've made the case extremely well. I know this event is generally focused on the capital replenishments, and one of the things I wanted to highlight was the concessional funds. Um, and my sense is when it comes to shareholding, ultimately the things that we're shareholding will get funded. Um, but where the shareholding isn't at risk, uh, there's a very real threat that the concessional windows, so the kind of soft money that goes to the most fragile, most poorest countries, is actually the funding that's most at risk. And my sense is there, the other nations that you've talked about will not be stepping in to pick up the tab. And the sort of signaling effect for Europe, because um, it's certainly being debated within my organization, is very, very strong. Uh, so I wonder if, if you could just talk a little bit about the concessional funds and what you think will happen if, if they're not funded. Thanks. Okay, and just this, there's a woman back here, and then we, we will do a second round of, of, uh, of, of questions. There was, one, one, it was this woman here. Yes, please. Yeah. Then we will do a second round of, of questions. Yeah. Hello, my name is Jay Dart, and I'm a student at Georgetown University, and also I'm interning here. Um, as Ambassador Green said, um, one of the benefits for giving to the MDBs is that it helps spread American values, such as capitalism, as you said. However, one of the major criticisms of banks, such as the World Bank, is that it's majorly like American-dominated and it doesn't um, spread global values enough. So I was wondering, for legitimacy purposes, um, I understand that the leadership of the World Bank or other organizations are mostly um, formed of American professionals, but um, would you think that maybe diversifying a little bit would help the bank as a whole? Thank you. Okay. As moderator, I'm going to jump in on a couple of these and then I'm going to let my, my colleagues. Uh, uh, I actually think um, the critics that, I'll, I'll respond to this one first, I think, um, uh, I think that the the World Bank and the multilateral development banks are exporters of an American form of globalization. There are other alternate versions, a darker versions of globalization that don't emphasize corrupt, anti-corruption measures, don't emphasize labor and environmental standards, uh, and don't emphasize democratic regimes or, 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 um, or free, free markets. And so I believe that um, it's important to have significant American leadership in them. And I think it's very difficult to sell to the American people something other than that. Uh, I think if we want to if we want to continue to have leadership in them, if, if we want to continue to contribute to them, we're going to have to have significant American leadership and influence over them. And so I think the answer to that one would be would be no. Um, on the it, let me just take this issue of legislative powers, then I'll ask the panelists to respond to any of these that they want to take on. I think one of the problems of the multilateral development banks, having been having been a, 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 been a beneficiary of, of working for one of them for four years, 
is I think they don't do a very good job of dealing with the tough, dumpy places. That's a technical term I learned at a, at a think tank. Um, that we, they don't yet, I think they still need to strengthen their ability to, to respond to failed and failing states and zones of conflict better. I think the models, the processes, the plumbing are all set up for sort of benign middle income countries and I think that we need to develop a, a stronger cadre of folks that are, that are comfortable in the toughest, worst places and to have m modalities of funding and assessments that think in those terms as opposed to doing a, a three-year assessment for a ring road in Afghanistan frankly isn't appropriate. And we need to have folks that are paid and promoted in that way. Certainly there have been strides, strides made in the last 10 or 15 years since the Balkans, but I think that there, there has not yet been enough um, in the multilaterals, at least in the MDBs in that area. I'd also say I don't think we should be mucking around, and that's another technical term, with the doing business agenda and the economic reform agenda that the United States, starting with the Bush administration, um, but also supported and, pro and supported by the Obama administration, um, have you know, led by the World Bank, but also with great, uh, great, you know, great work by the Inter-American Development Bank on sort of economic reform work. We shouldn't be screwing around with the secret sauce of making those sort of economic reforms change. And sometimes there's been some push back on the hill. I think um, sometimes, I think counter, my view counterproductively on that. So um, stronger anti, uh, uh, stronger conflict uh, capabilities, and let's not let's not mess with the secret sauce of economic reform. That's my my view. So I'll open the panel to responding to any of those, please. Well, I'll just say that um, I appreciate the person who just left who talked about uh, anti-corruption because it was a mistake of mine not to. Obviously, that is a huge issue, one that that is a big part of what we do and the framework that we've brought and the kinds of reforms that we've brought to countries and, and it is really essential. Um, the concessional window question, so at least at the IDB, our concessional window is in fact fully funded. That piece of it has actually gone effective. Um, and as a part of the capital increase, we're increasing our lending to the smallest and most vulnerable countries to 35% of all of the lending that we do. Last year we were at 33% already. Uh, I expect that we'll probably surpass that goal. Um, and it's the, the, the financial reforms will make that sustainable through 2020. So I think that the concessional window is actually, it's a smaller window for us, but it's actually in relatively good shape. Um, the um, leadership diversification, I'll answer a little bit differently, Dan. Um, because the IDB actually is a little bit different. Um, the president of the organization is always somebody who is from the region. And I benefit from the, the thing that you're concerned about, which is I'm an American and I am the chief operating officer and that is also uh, the case. But, but I think, so I think that there's a balance between diversification and enough presence so that the kinds of things Dan was talking about, people on the Hill and others can buy into. Um, there is a tendency in each of these institutions to have perhaps a little bit too much of the passport mattering. And what we're all trying to do, I think, is to move to a place where we're hiring the best athlete. And, and that's what we're trying to do as well. So, and I think all of the institutions can benefit from more of, or anyway ours can, can benefit from more of that, but it does have to have a bit of a balance when you're trying to make sure that the political support for the kinds of funding that you need is in place. So it's, it's not such a black and white kind of world. Um, and then lastly, um, the, the question about what else could be in the legislation. Really, as a recipient of that kind of stuff, I would say the kitchen sink is in there. No, I, I'm, I'm overstating. But you know, the U.S. Treasury has done an excellent job in the case of the IDB from the perspective of the U.S. taxpayer of putting lending targets, results frameworks, um, new financial safeguards, increasing lending to small and vulnerable countries. Um, each one of these things, which is a part of the reform agenda encompassed in the, the general capital increase, make the institution um, in many ways stronger. I, I would say that it also makes the institution in many ways less flexible. And again, this is a world of gray. Um, you know, you, you have to be careful about, maybe this is your secret sauce thing, you know, you have to be careful um, about putting so many restrictions in place in the interests of creating a better institution that you destroy the flexibility of the institution to respond to events on the ground in a way that, that works for those who, remember, are, are borrowing 
um, th from the institution. So, you know, I think there's a balance there that has to be maintained. A any and all those questions for the other three? Sure, and I'll, I'll be brief so we can get to a, a second bank of questions. Um, uh, and I want to associate myself with much of what, uh, what Julie said. First off, no one's suggesting that these institutions are perfect. Um, man is inherently flawed and there are no perfect institutions. However, what I think is also clear is that there, these are evolving and improving institutions and I, I think a lot of credit uh, needs to go to U.S. leadership in doing that and it's something that, need, that we need to reaffirm and enhance wherever we can. I mean, uh, two other quick points. What is clear to those who are perhaps not so solid in their support for the replenishment requests, there is no circumstance in which the U.S. Uh, not fulfilling its obligations or withdrawing will enhance these institutions mm. and continue the reform agenda. That is in, indisputable. I guess finally, um, just in the, the, the comment about American values, uh, I'm one of those who believes that the values that are being promoted through the, these institutions aren't American values. I mean, they, they are much more universal. And the values of creating opportunity and, and giving um, uh, leaders in their country the ability to respond to basic human needs, to creating economic opportunity so that um, uh, families, that parents have this sense that tomorrow might actually be better for their children than what it is today. Um, I'm an American, but I don't think that's just an American value. I think it's really a universal value. And I, and I think we, um, we cheapen the institutions if we suggest that these are narrowly, rigidly the province of Americans, because I don't think that's the case. Uh, on, on all of those issues, I just want to give, give my proxy to, to Mark, because I agree with every word of what he just uh, what he just said. But on the on the on the, uh, on the corruption issue, um, I think there's a there is a danger in that. I mean, we have made enormous progress on uh, on corruption. It has not gone away though, as a uh, commensurately as a concern. Uh, on the Hill and in the perceptions of most people as to what uh, happens with development dollars that uh, that get sent overseas. And the most important thing we could do, we're going to talk about results, but also just just try to get as as good as we possibly can get on on uh, transparency. And even our, our friend from, from DFID might well, actually appreciate this this example because it was a DFID, uh, DFID program. Um, this is at the, in the Canberra uh, in the Kibera slum in, in Nairobi, uh, DFID had a, a textbook program when um, uh, uh, Kenya moved towards uh, universal, universal primary education. Of course, they had just, you know, great reform, right? huge need for things like desks and books and you know, school supplies with a huge influx of, of uh, the number of students that were coming into the system. So, so DFID had a wonderful program to provide um, to provide textbooks, and you know, so it, it, I visited this school in um, in Nairobi, and and outside the school, what they had was a big board um, that uh, identified for the parents in that neighborhood to see, so that everyone could see exactly where every single shilling of that program was spent, what was bought, how many books. How many pencils, right? Like every single, and then and they had a bottom line, and at the bottom it was like 10 shillings left. And I never found out what they did with that last 10 shillings, right? And and we actually we, we took a we took a photograph of that board, and when we went up to the hill to um, you know to lobby, talk to the appropriations committees and lobby Congress, we got that picture blown up on a big you know three foot by five foot blow up of that of that board to say. This is what we're talking about on effectiveness and results and tracking every last shilling. So you can see we are deadly serious about this, about you know, how we can be the best stewards of your money and you know, to convince them that you know, we're serious about it, the multilateral development banks are getting serious about it, uh, other development institutions are getting serious about it, and, and as long as we keep doing that, you know, we, you know, to encourage them to be uh, to continue to be generous with contributions to uh, to the institution. So I think you know, like simple things like that, we need to do a lot more of to keep showing how this is being done today 
as opposed to how it was uh, had been done in the past. Dan, any comments on the more questions? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna take a couple more. Yeah, there are more over here. There's a woman in a, a pink, pink sweater. Yeah, hi, I'm I'm Deanna Gregg with BNA, and since this uh, subject is the general capital increase, I was wondering if you could address the status of it legislative wise um, and where are the it, what, where is it most likely to run into trouble? I believe it's come out of the Senate appropriations. But. Hi, I'm Shirley Wang. I'm interning at Treasury. And I was wondering about um, joint initiatives between different multilaterals and IFIs. And so one that comes to mind is the Arab Financing Facility for Infrastructure, where uh, it's a joint venture between the World Bank, uh, the IMF, uh, IFC, and different IFIs. And they're trying to raise billions of dollars for infrastructure projects through both public and private sector financing windows. And um, what I was curious about is um, where, well, a part of this, um, a part of this project is that they have like a technical assistance facility for um, uh, guidance on private-public partnerships, which is like the main mechanism through which these projects would come to fruition. And so I was wondering where the U.S. would best be able to provide assistance to develop these kind of uh, joint ventures outside of just a general capital increase, and um, where the where that kind of funding would come from. Thank you. friend from the European Union. Glacia Vasikeri, I'm with the European Union and I do the liaison with the World Bank. Um, you talked a lot about uh, US leadership abroad and how through the process of foreign aid uh, this could be reclaimed, re but uh, I haven't heard the panelists or the previous uh, speakers to talk at all about partnerships. Um, I follow the coordination of the Europeans at the World Bank, representing there the Commission, and when they try to reach some kind of common agreement before they go to the board, I have noticed that there is not always the debate which says, in addition to finding the common denominator amongst us, let's go out there and talk to those other chairs who share with us the same principles overall, which is uh, free market and democracy and anti-corruption, to kind of go to this board where decisions are taken by consensus uh, with a strong argument uh, promoted, let's say, by what we call the Western world in particular at the time that, as you mentioned, new players like China are coming in more willing to compromise all these standards, safeguards, and clauses that have been acquired so far in the process of the economic development. And uh, I think it's a two-way street. It's not, I don't have, let's say, I. I have the impression that there is no, I know a lot of work, a lot of work is happening prior to a proposal going to the board because there they have decided the consensus and there is not a lot of time to be given. But uh, I have the impression that at the level of the preparation, the concept of partnership and let's work together with everybody else at the board who could help us to enhance a strong view uh, is not there. So I would like your comment. Thank you. Mark, could I put you on the spot and um, respond to the issue of the, the state of play? Sure. In terms of, uh, of the legislation, um, I think we saw this morning in Chairman Miller uh, really the state of play. I mean, this is where the legislation is. What's been key, appropriators right now are making very tough choices in a very difficult political environment, very difficult fiscal environment, and uh, they turn to the authorizers, of which Chairman Miller and Congressman McCarthy lead uh, the subcommittee, International Monetary Policy of Financial Services, and asked to uh, flesh out through testimony uh, the importance of these institutions, 
why it's in uh, the taxpayers' interest for the replenishment to go forward and for these institutions to keep going forward. And uh, they've had several hearings, including one just a couple of days ago. And that record um, is going to reinforce what happens going forward. I understand that the vice chair of the committee, of the subcommittee, will be formally introducing the legislation in coming days. They will presumably schedule a vote in the subcommittee. And the results of that subcommittee vote will send a strong signal to appropriators on the level of support that is, uh, that is out there. So uh, this is uh, obviously from the perspective of the IDB rather than from the perspective of the World Bank. But I think you know, in this resource-constrained world in which we find ourselves, the concept of partnerships for the MDBs has changed quite dramatically. And, and I see actually a great deal of work on that score. Uh, we establish an office of outreach and partnerships with exactly this in mind, which is there is a huge group of, and, and Mark, you alluded to this, of donors. There's a donor community out there, both countries and others, let's call them foundations and others, who are interested in the self-same topics. And it's our responsibility to coordinate well and properly. And one of the silver linings in Haiti, I think, is that the demands to actually coordinate, rather than walk into a room, tell people what you're doing, what I'm doing, and then walk back out of the room, that doesn't cut it anymore. So from our perspective, you know, I could, let me name just a couple of things. ICID, which is the Spanish Development Fund, huge contributors together with us on various projects. Agence France du Développement, huge contributor to projects together with us. The Nordic Investment Fund. Each of these guys has their own focus, and so their funds are generally directed toward a specific arena. And now that work is done before we go to our board. And then on the other side, the other actors. You know, we're doing lots of things with Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, the Gates Foundation, Carlos Slim. I mean, all kinds of actors who 15 or 10 or even five years ago you wouldn't have been speaking about who we, with whom we are engaged and, and toward whom we have a very substantial effort to make sure that we're involved with them and they're involved with us. Why don't I take the, uh, the second question about how, where's the U.S. play? I think in an, I, I've been writing about the fact that the 10-year bull market on ODA is coming to an end, and we're looking at a 10 or 20 percent cut in official development assistance. So I think the United States is going to be looking for ways to leverage other monies. And how do I think we have unique convening power, and I think we've also got the ability to make available soft monies that oftentimes is these institutions oftentimes the, the the harder money to get a hold of is the soft grant monies and so i think where we can play a role is on uh, using soft grant monies uh, in a variety of ways to share risk is oftentimes where we can we can play a unique role as well as funding specific targeted technical assistance in addition to convening these various actors leveraging our executive directors and our and, and, and our convening power around that. And there have been some examples in the past of the United States doing that. I'm, I'm cognizant of the time. I know we haven't been able to answer everybody's questions, but I, um, I'm very grateful uh, to everybody sticking around and, and for, uh, for the panel discussion. Uh, so I ask you to join me in thanking the panel. <laughs>